Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives, whether you're here in person or joining us on our YouTube station. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our second annual McGowan Forum on Ethics and Leadership to examine the topic of the challenge of big data. But let me start by just um, sharing with you Late breaking news about the JFK assassination um, records. Um, we will be, the National Archives tonight, will be releasing 2,800 records that have not been seen for the first time. Um, and the president has decided to um, give the agencies another six months to review their work um, for release. So. Unfortunately, we're not releasing everything tonight, but we are releasing 2,800 records. So, before we begin our discussion, I'd like to tell you about um, an upcoming program here in the McGowan Theater and our new exhibit. On Tuesday, September, uh, November 7th at noon, retired Lieutenant General Daniel P. Bolger will tell us about his book, Our Year of War, Two Brothers, Vietnam and the Nation Divided. One brother supported the war, the other detested it, but they fought it together. Joining General Bulger will be the, those brothers, Chuck and Tom Hagel. We'll launch our new next exhibit, Remembering Vietnam, on November 10th, Veterans Day, in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. This exhibit is a media-rich exploration of the Vietnam War, featuring interviews with American and Vietnamese veterans and civilians and firsthand experiences of war the war's events, as well as historic analysis. It's a fascinating collection of newly discovered and iconic original documents, images, film footage, and artifacts that illuminate 12 critical episodes in the war that divided the peoples of both the United States and Vietnam. Now I'd like to take a moment, if you'd bring the lights up, please, I'd like to take a moment to ask all of our Vietnam veterans or any United States veterans who served on active duty in the United States Armed Forces during the Vietnam era, November 1st, 1955, to May 15th, 1975, to stand and be recognized. <laughs> Veterans, as you exit the McGowan Theater after tonight's program, National Archives staff will present each of you with this lapel pin, the Vietnam veteran lapel pin. On the back of the pin is embossed, a great foundation thanks and honors you. The United States of America Vietnam War Commemoration is a national initiative, and the lapel pin is the nation's lasting memento of thanks. To learn more about our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events online at archives.gov. Check our website to sign up to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. Pick up an application for membership in the lobby or become a member online at archivesfoundation.org. For the past decade, the National Archives has hosted two annual McGowan forums on women in leadership and on communications in honor of MCI Communications founder William McGowan. In light of the changing landscape of our nation, the Archives has recently redirected the annual Spring McGowan Forum to focus on ethics. For our second forum on ethics, we are examining the challenge of big data. Here at the National Archives, we have faced data challenges from our earliest days. When we opened our doors more than 80 years ago, staff were faced with the enormous task of taking in and making sense of a cascade of paper records from federal agencies. Over the decades since then, we've continued to receive paper documents, but we've also taken in a tremendous volume of electronic records. We now hold more than 20 billion electronic records, hundreds of terabytes of information, and the numbers continue to grow. These records provide invaluable insight into the work of the U.S. government you can find detailed statistics compiled during studies of education programs, mortgage data compiled by Federal Housing Administration, investment data collected by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and so much more. We too must continue to find the right balance of protecting privacy and sensitive information 
while making the rest of these records as broadly available as possible. So I look forward to hearing our panelists examine the challenge of big data and how to meet it. Tonight's program is presented with the generous support of the National Archives Foundation and the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. And we thank them both for their continued support of our programs over the years. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Olivia Bundles, Chair of the National Archives Foundation. Olivia is comp completing six years as Chair and 12 years on the Board of Directors of the Foundation. She's brought her passion and skills as a journalist and author to the cause of raising awareness of our na nation's historical legacy. Thank you, Olivia, for your service, dedication, and enthusiasm on behalf of the National Archives. Please welcome Olivia Bundles. Thank you very much, David. And I'm not leaving the board board. I'm just ending my term as chair, which has been a lot of fun and a real honor. Um, on behalf of the board of directors of the National Archives Foundation, I welcome you to the second annual McGowan Forum on Ethics. Tonight's topic is the challenge of big data. As a National Archives nonprofit partner, the foundation generates creative and financial support for the archives' public programming, exhibitions, and educational initiatives. I invite all of you who are here tonight and everyone who is watching online to visit the foundation's website, as David said, at archivesfoundation.org. You can also sign up for our e-newsletter so that you'll be among the first to know about our programs and so that you can register early so that you can make sure that you have a seat inside the beautiful McGowan Theater. How many of you who are here have tonight have been here before? Good. We all, you know, I'm so glad to see that we have so many return people. Don't we have great programming? <laughs> those of you who are here tonight and those of you who are online know that we are gathered this evening in the beautiful William G. McGowan Theater that was um, given to us by the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. The fund is a philanthropic family foundation established in 1992 to perpetuate Bill McGowan's tradition of compassionate philanthropy and ethical leadership. The vision of the fund is to make a difference in the lives of people, to create sustainable change, and to empower future generations to achieve their greatest potential. In addition to the support of the National Archives Foundation, the Chicago-based McGowan Fund promotes, nurtures, and funds many signature programs throughout the United States. We are especially grateful to have our on, the, on our board, the fund's executive director, Diana Spencer. We are also very pleased to have with us here tonight, Mary Ann Brand, a board member at the William G. McGowan Fund. Mary Ann has been an avid supporter of our work for many years, and she is back again. We always appreciate it when she comes traveling here to uh, help us explore some of the most interesting issues of our day and the elements of greatest interest to Bill McGowan, former National Archives President and founder of the William G. McGowan Fund. Please help me welcome Mary Ann Brand. Good evening. I am pleased to be with you this evening representing the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. As Lilia said, I am Mary Ann Brand, a trustee of the fund. Our family created the fund in 1993 to preserve the legacy of my uncle, Bill McGowan, who had died the previous year. Bill was a legendary entrepreneur, a global business icon, and dedicated philanthropist. The fund partnered with the National Archives 14 years ago to create and construct this public theater. Here, outstanding documentaries are screened and cutting edge ideas are debated. The theater embodies Bill McGowan's affection for history, movies, and exploring issues of the day. Shortly after the theater was launched, the fund partnered with the National Archives to establish two legacy programs, the annual Fall Forum 
originally focused on communications, technology, and government, and last year was repurposed to concentrate on ethics, a, top essential, a topic essential to just society. The annual Spring Forum maintains its longtime focus on women in leadership. The Fall Forum on Ethics blends seamlessly with another McGowan Fund initiative, the McGowan Fellows Program. The Fellows Program provides full tuition scholarship for 10 talented second year MBA students at 10 premier US MBA programs. They interweave academic and group leadership with societal concerns. During the fellows year, they collaborate on a social impact initiative. If you want to know more about it, I can talk about it till the cows come home. So just ask me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the fellows program was inspired by Bill McGowan's own story. My uncle had spent one year in college before joining the US Army during World War II, where he served as a medic. After the war, he was able to finish his undergraduate degree with the help of the GI Bill. Having worked on the railroad during the summers, he had saved just enough money for his first year at Harvard Business School. An unexpected scholarship enabled him to continue and earn his MBA. Following Harvard, he went directly into the field of business consulting. He was hired by a small Midwest company called MCI that provided communications for the trucking industry. He saw the potential in the communications industry and went on to grow the company into telecommunications giant. He led MCI's hard-fought legal victory, which overturned AT&T's monopoly on the US phone service. The ensuing healthy competition paved the way for the consumer choice and the technological advances we all enjoy today. Bill McGowan's prominence only amplified his concern for the plight of society's most vulnerable populations. In that spirit, the fund has made over $145 million in grants since its inception. Our grantees are effective community-based providers in the areas of education for underserved youth, medical research and healthcare, and support for basic human needs. Tonight, our 13th annual fall forum examines the challenge of big data. How do we accommodate our world to the complexities of advancing technology? For example, what are the repercussions of accidents involving driverless cars? How do we preserve privacy in a world where the web knows all? To what extent are corporations or government bodies obligated to protect our personal data? Although technology confers tremendous connection and opportunity, ethical underpinnings must become part of the conversation. Uncle Bill would have jumped into tonight's discussion with both feet. I mentioned he loved debating the issues of the day, and we are examining the issue of our era. Thanks to our panelists for sharing their time and expertise with us. I'm looking forward to a lively discourse. Our distinguished panelists this evening include John Verdi. He is Vice President of Policy at the Future of Privacy Forum, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank that seeks to advance responsible data practices. John? <laughs> Here he comes. <laughs> Michelle Demoy is director of the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. She advocates for data privacy rights and protection of legislation and regulation. There she comes. <laughs> Mark DaCosta is the founder and chairman of Enigma, an operational analytics platform built on top of the world's broadest collection of public data. He's right there. <laughs> Mark. Neil Chilson was appointed acting chief technologist for the Federal Trade Commission in July 2017. Prior to his appointment as acting chief technologist, Chilson was an attorney advisor to acting chairman Maureen K. Olison. Right. And our moderator this evening is Kim Hart. She's with the technology, she's the technology editor at Axios, overseeing coverage of the intersection of business, technology, and policy. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I look forward to having a great discussion on a really interesting topic with my panelists here. Um, as she said, I am the technology editor at Axios. We are about 
10 months old now, a media startup. We cover both technology and also topics like future of work um, and science and how uh, the technology being developed in places like Silicon Valley and New York and Seattle are uh, kind of colliding with what's going on in the policy world. And this is kind of ground zero for some of those issues, some of these issues, the, the data issues and how to regulate, deal with, and protect um, data for both companies and individuals and society at large is um, one of the bigger debates going on right now. Um, so I have to give my little plug that if you want to receive our newsletters and hear more about some of these issues, you can go to um, sign up at axios.com. Uh, now that that's over, um, I, I w wanted to um, start the conversation by giving some broad definitions. Uh, there are a lot of terms in this discussion, uh, like artificial intelligence and machine learning and algorithm, that tend to be thrown around um, and uh, kind of casually these days, particularly in the news media and as companies are pitching themselves and talking about their products. Um, and so I thought it would be helpful to just go over a brief uh, top line definition for some of the terms that we'll be talking about today. And then I'll kick, in, kick it off to conversation and then we will get to your questions. Um, so talking about big data, what we're talking about tonight, the basis of it, it refers to extremely large data sets that may be analyzed uh, to reveal patterns, trends, and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. So as all of our daily lives go digital, businesses are, are bombarded with this type of data every day. Um, and many of them are still figuring out how to glean the best analysis from it and insights uh, to deliver better services to all of us. Um, artificial intelligence is kind of a, a layer up from that. Um, it's the replication of human intelligence in com by computers. When AI research first started, the researchers were trying to replicate human intelligence for specific tasks, like playing a game. Um, and they introduced rules that the computer used to make those kinds of decisions. Then we kind of entered into the realm of machine learning, which refers to the ability of a machine to learn using large data sets instead of using these hard co coded rules. This allows computers to learn uh, by themselves, taking advantage of the processing power of modern computers that can easily process large data sets. How is all this possible? by a little thing called algorithm, called algorithms. Um, at its most basic level, an algorithm is a set of instructions that tell a computer what to do. So when people talk about algorithms these days, they're often talking about the operations that power our Facebook and Twitter feeds, um, or the items that Amazon recommends to us based on our own preferences when we log on to the site. This is where machine learning comes in. Instead of repeatedly processing a stable set of instructions, systems now use machine learning to rewrite themselves as they work. And part of the issue that we'll talk about tonight is that machine learning algorithms are effectively programming themselves, meaning that they can sometimes be unpredictable. And that's where some of the anxiety comes in in some of these topics that we'll be talking about. Um, last but not least is the Internet of Things. Um, this basically refers to a network of internet connected objects that are able to collect and exchange data using embedded sensors. So the easiest way of thinking about this concept is basically connecting any device other than a PC or a laptop or tablet, things that you t typically are used to connecting to the internet, anything that has an on and off switch to the internet. This could be a refrigerator, a toaster, a hair dryer, your thermostat, a teddy bear, or even a car. Um, this creates an enormous amount of data in itself. An FTC staff report found that fewer than that no, sorry, that fewer than 10,000 households using a company's IoT home automation product can generate 150 million discrete data points a day, or approximately one data point every six seconds in every household. And Neil can weigh more on, on that. But so basically, what we're talking about today is the ethics of governing the use of this data. Um, as well as what those uses mean for our jobs, privacy, security, and society at large going forward. So um, not a, a light topic, I guess, in some ways. <laughs> so I would like to start off by asking all of our panelists who are really well steeped on different areas of this topic to identify what one thing that they see as being a really large benefit of big data and the uses of big data, and also one thing that they see as being a pretty large downside or a threat. Um, and Neil, start with you. Sure, uh, thank you very much, and, and thanks so much to the, the National Archives Foundation for having uh, this panel and for inviting me to participate. Um, that's a difficult question, in part because big data, I like to think of it as a way to sort of magnify um, human mental force, mental ability, the same way that the steam engine 
or, or even going back further, the lever uh, magnifies human physical force. And so when, when you put it in that sort of term, you can, you can see that there would be, it's, it's like, what were the major benefits of the lever? That's a very difficult question to answer because there's so many potential benefits in the future. Um, but I'll pick one. Uh, and I, I really think that the, the, the benefits in how we treat medicine are going to be, in, or how we treat people for disease are going to be enormous. Right now we have uh, a lot of medical research is based on sort of broad averages of uh, diseases that people have. I think big data is going to allow us to be much more specific in treating a disease at the individual level in how it expresses itself in humans, uh, in an indivi uh, individual human. And I think that's going to be, bring a sort of personalization to medical treatment that, is, uh, that I think has great, great promise and I'm very excited about. Um, well, I, I won't call it a downside, but I'll call it a, a, a challenge. Um, it's, it's like, again, the challenge with the lever. Uh, yeah, powerful tools can be used. Uh, you can make mistakes with them, and you can also uh, misuse them. Um, I think the, the big challenge that we have is the challenge that this panel is trying to address, which is how do we, how do we uh, address the concerns that society has about this technology without prohibiting the massive benefits that are likely to uh, come from it. And uh, almost, almost all technologies face this initial skepticism. There's early adopters, there's skepticism, there's a sort of lot of stories that can be told about the, the possible downsides, and then we get more familiar with it and we kind of accept it. The question is, how do we get to that point where we as a society have adapted both our, our legal approaches, our personal uh, uses, and our conception of the world so that this technology can, can really bring the benefits that, that, it has, uh, that it has the potential to bring. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, Kim, I think it's, it's a great question. From my perspective, um, you know, I suppose like, you know, when you think about big data, what, what is it about it that, you know, is really most exciting at this point? For me, it's, you know, in the most simple way, it's ability to find patterns. So we're in a moment today where, um, as you said, you know, uh, more and more data is being produced every day. It's being accumulated. Um, and from that, we're now in a position where we can start to uh, certainly understand um, uh, what's going on from a health perspective, but even looking at things like uh, building safety and fire risk and uh, credit risk and all sorts of other um, opportunities to go and take this data, analyze patterns, and use it to make better decisions. Um, and there's you know, tremendous amount of opportunity there by uh, bringing together all this data in, into one place. I think the, the downsides, though, are the extent to which we do these sorts of analyses, um, apply the learnings from these patterns in ways that aren't sensitive to the sort of unintended biases or um, other ramifications that are, are baked into those patterns. So if we're analyzing uh, a history of um, crime or recidivism data and using that to make predictions about the future, we have to certainly be cognizant of the fact that that historical data has baked in it uh, a history of potentially uh, structural racism in the country. Or if we're looking at um, uh, sort of payroll history of people, uh, we need to understand that you know, gender disparities in, in pay data cert certainly exist. And so as we're going and finding patterns about how things have happened in the past, we need to be very sensitive to um, what sorts of agencies and, and applications and sort of uh, ways that that's being used in the world today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michelle. Well, let's see. I think they kind of took the ones that I was going to say. <laughs> um, so one of the things, I'm, I'm a little nerdy, so one of the things that I, I found to be really cool about um, machine learning in, is its application in science and farming. <laughs> I said it was nerdy. So, um, you know, NASA has worked with farmers to, to use patterns to create better seeds, to uh, create better irrigation systems, things that actually sort of solve problems that we face as a, as a um, mankind faces, let's say, humankind faces. Um, I think those are really interesting, and I think those have a lot of, of application and merit. It's certainly in health, there's a lot of really cool thing, um, projects going on that alleviate sort of long-standing problems like kidney disease and other things. And, and they find patterns, amazingly, that you know, doctors who've done this for years and years would not. And so those are great. I think those are great. Um, Mark touched on some of the bias that can get baked into, as we say, into some of the automated systems. And 
for me, that's a huge, huge problem. The idea that you are, have the government using systems that are perpetuating societal bias is really alarming to me, especially because there's very little accountability uh, and transparency into these systems. But sometimes that's because it's incredibly difficult to do that, and sometimes it's because we don't understand enough about the systems to really be able to test things like reliability or accuracy. So the application of like predictive policing, which you sort of touched on, that that's really concerning to me. The idea that the government might use this to deploy resources, welfare resources or child welfare resources, things that have huge impact on the, the fabric of our country. And you know, we lack any kind of real knowledge about how the decisions are being made and how accurate they might be. Um, those, those are sort of the other things. And then maybe the, the most dystopian thing that keeps me up at night <laughs> is the idea of um, weapons. So you know, we artificial intelligence is being applied to a lot of different um, weaponry systems. And again, without any kind of accountability or real understanding of the tools, that's pretty frightening to me um, as, as somebody who, who looks at these systems and, and tries to look for where the civil liberties impact might be. Um, so that, that is probably the thing that keeps me most worried. John, just to end it on a happy. <laughs> <laughs> Try to reel that one back yeah, in, Michelle. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, so I, I think um, the the three previous panelists um, were, were right on target with the positives and negatives. Um, when I think about health, um, I think about the potential for big data to make meaningful impacts on folks' lives when they're alive, and also to help them live longer. Right. When we talk about safety issues, when we talk about uh, some of the issues that Michelle touched on, um, I think those are all super encouraging. One of the areas that I would probably highlight is education. Um, big data analysis and algorithmic analysis of educational outcomes has the potential to improve absolute educational outcomes across the population and make sure that our children and young, adult, young adults are better educated and better prepared um, to be productive members of the technology-based economy that we find ourselves in in 2017. Um, it also has the potential to try to reduce some of those traditional discrepancies amongst um, groups in terms of class, in terms of race, in terms of income, um, in terms of region, right, where those educational outcomes have been uneven. Um, big data analysis can help improve personalized learning to mitigate some of those traditionally human failures that we mm -hmm. have, right? Um, in terms of a downside, it's a, to me exactly the other side of that coin that same big data analysis that can be used to increase education uh, in terms of outcomes, that can better make um, children and young adults able to participate in a robust and meaningful way in the economy, can also be used intentionally or unintentionally to deepen divides. And I think that we need to be cognizant, um, as, as Mark mentioned, that Right now we're in a stage where machine learning, artificial intelligence, and algorithmic decision making are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily focused on accuracy. And that's a good thing because you really want accurate algorithms. You really want the algorithm or the neural network to do the thing that you asked it to do as opposed to something else, right? Um, but we, I think, need to mature as we move through this technological and policy and social conversation um, to a place where we're also talking about um, not just how accurate the algorithms are overall, but whether or not they impact minority populations who by definition have a smaller impact on the overall accuracy rate right, than others, whether they impact those populations in disparate ways um, so that everyone is gaining the benefit of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and improvements in learning, health, safety that can be had from algorithmic decision making. So one of the, the topics that I heard brought up and that I wanted to make sure that we explored given the topic of this program is how to deal with those unintended consequences um, and the impact of certain communities um, and, and certain segments of society unintentionally, uh, probably, or hopefully. Uh, but if we're talking about technology that is being designed by humans, humans ourselves have unconscious biases you know, that we bring to the table without meaning to. 
Um, but we are designing these algorithms and helping the computers learn what, to, telling the computers what to do at first, and then helping to perpetuate certain algorithms going forward. And in doing so, are we perpetuating certain unconscious biases that we hope the technology would help to solve for, but instead maybe perpetuating them? So, and you, for those of you who who have been thinking about this, um, that means all of you, but. Whose responsibility is it to try to keep that in check? Is it the, the companies that are designing these technologies and the computer scientists and technologists who are, are really sitting there coding all day and figuring out how to make these computers and these machines smarter and smarter and smarter? And how can the government keep up with that? What responsibility does the, the public sector have um, to have that dialogue? Um, you know, earlier this week, the technology industry put out a, se a set of principles um, you know, pledging to use artificial intelligence and this really powerful, these powerful tools responsibly um, and laid out some things, um, one of them including making sure that the technology was always controllable by humans. And, you know, some things that seem very science fictiony. And so I would love your take, um, maybe Neil, on, on the government side and what the, how can the government stay connected to what the private sector is doing? And also, um, you know, John, I know you work with a lot of companies and, and Mark and your experience as well. Um, how, how can the companies be as proactive as possible? And maybe, they're, obviously, they need to meet in the middle, but how do you ensure that happens when this conversation is already kind of just hard to understand and follow? Right, so uh, a little bit of background maybe on the Federal Trade Commission where I am the chief technologist. Um, the FTC is the general uh, consumer protection enforcement agency. It also has a competition uh, enforcement uh, role as well. Um, and what, as that, in that role, it has a, uh, an important job as the primary enforcer of privacy and data security uh, rules in the US. So uh, the way that works in the big data sphere is um, we prevent companies from, we bring cases against companies who do deceptive or unfair practices. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned those, those, uh, the principles that the industry had laid out uh, earlier this week. Um, one of the ways in which the FTC, without being overly prescriptive, without um, having a, uh, without having to have a really specific set of uh, principles that a company has to follow, which is a very hard thing to, to do in this space that is moving so quickly, um, we can hold companies to the promises that they make. Um, under, under Section 5 of the FTC Act. So when a company promises that, for example, uh, uh, that the, the algorithm will always be under human control, uh, if they don't keep that promise, the FTC can bring uh, an action against them, uh, an enforcement action. And the FTC has actually studied the big data issue in, in some depth. We actually had a, uh, a workshop and then a report. It was called Big Data, a Tool for Inclusion or Exclusion that very much uh, attempted to address the, the issues of how do we make sure this is a uh, technology that benefits everybody. Um, and, and we looked at some of the laws that already exist outside of the FTC Act, which is a basic one, that also address some of the other bias issues that we might have. So there's something called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which you could call the first big data law. It was passed in the 70s that's all about how credit reporting agencies are allowed to use or not use your data. Um, and then we have all the equal opportunity laws that are enforced uh, by, by the FTC, but then by uh, private litigants and also uh, DOJ and other uh, state agencies and uh, prosecutors. And that, that's a foundation that addresses some of the concerns of how this, this tool that we don't quite know how it's going to be used, but it gets at the sort of harms that might come at, that might come out from this and, and so we have some tools already that focus on outcomes, and that's one way to, for the government to be able to keep up, is if you focus on what is the outcome uh, of a process, uh, and is it good or bad, and then, and then focus uh, enforcement actions where it's gone wrong, um, you can, it's easier for government to pursue uh, action in that space rather than having to, ahead of time, predict every bad thing that might happen and tell companies not to. Yeah, I think, I think this is an extremely timely 
uh, moment to be having this conversation because, in fact, a lot of the questions that you posed, you know, are they're unanswered and they're under a really active debate right now. I mean, I think it certainly bears just kind of reminding ourselves that big data and data science as, you know, words that we're discussing are really not even 10 years old at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that we are at an era where, you know, I, I think we're even grasping a little bit for the right metaphors or the right ways of understanding uh, what is happening. You know, um, in some ways we can think about uh, what's happening with algorithms and big data right now as tantamount to the installation of like a water utility or something that is going to be there, is going to touch and impact, um, you know, all citizens in different ways. And once it's installed, uh, you know, it's, it's there for a very long time and it's really difficult to, uh, to, to sort of change or update. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about uh, impact around big data and algorithms, the first thing to, to sort of recognize is that, you know, I think in the public sector that this, these sorts of technologies and these sorts of pattern uh, recognizing techniques and, and decision making techniques are actually being installed uh, in government and in the ways in which services are provided to people, the ways in which uh, districting happens, the ways in which uh, resources are allocated. And so consequently, there's a lot of different stakeholders that uh, need to kind of, I think, come to the table in these conversations. So, um, you know, certainly I think a big challenge here on the government side is, is the issue of um, sort of black boxes and the fact that in many respects, the kinds of decision-making principles that are baked into uh, big data and algorithms are not necessarily even available for public scrutiny and, um, and transparency in how those decisions are being made. Uh, I certainly think within the context of the technology companies that are making these uh, software, uh, there's uh, certainly a lot that can be done. I think your point, uh, Kim, was really apt to, to sort of note that the biases and sort of points of view of these systems really reflect in a lot of ways the people that, that design and make them. And I think certainly from a, you know, a, a sort of a company perspective, it's really important to be sensitive to uh, the kind of even like diversity of the teams that are working on these. Um, you know, there's you know, cases where you know, you'll have um, male driven AI uh, projects that are sort of developing health apps that actually have nothing to say about women, uh, women's health issues because they're not necessarily part of the design parameters, not really part of what's um, ordinarily being asked of these systems as, as they go on. So I think. Um, that, that's sort of a, a key part of it. Michelle? Um, so uh, the United States, I used to say the United States is one of two Western democracies without a baseline privacy law. And then Turkey passed one. <laughs> 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 Granted, it's, it's a, it looks a little different there than it would, <laughs> might look here. But uh, regardless, the United States lacks a baseline privacy law, which means it's a free-for-all in, in many ways. There are some laws... Um, you know, that Neil mentioned that, that cover very sectoral parts of the digital economy. But for the most part, the reality is that the industry, the, the companies that, which is almost every company now, right, a, a data or technology company, have resisted any kind of regulation. And, and for the most part, that, I think, has been to their detriment. And I, I know this is sort of a controversial thing. A lot of companies feel and say that if there is government regulation, it will, you know, it will be behind us. It will stop innovation. This is sort of what you hear a lot. I don't think that's the case. I think it is possible to regulate certain parts of, of our rights. So privacy is a fundamental right. Um, it's a human right, and it's something that enables democracy and freedom. So how do we protect that? Well, we, we have examples of how to do it. And in fact, you know, the EU, for example, the General Data Protection Regulation, which will come into full force in May of next year, they have attempted to address some of the questions around algorithmic bias. They haven't done it perfectly, I think, in my opinion, but they've, they've addressed some of the inputs too, not just the outcomes, but how, how algorithms are created. And I think that there's a promising place there for regulation to say that these data sets, these tools are interrogated by the people who create them, whether that's a government entity or a private entity. Um, it is something that's possible, and in fact, CDT has spent a lot of time with companies who say, who are sort of saying, help us figure this out, because it's really complicated. We don't, we're not, you know, we are software engineers or data scientists. We don't necessarily have a background in ethics. We don't necessarily have a sense of what we should be looking for. So we actually created an interrogatory tool that does that, that looks at the creation of algorithms from implementation to design to testing, 
And it's not a perfect tool at all, and it's definitely an evolving thing. But I do think the government has a place there. I do also think that um, the states, if the, if the federal government doesn't act, will and are trying to. And in some ways, that is also a detriment to us because you know, citizens in one state may have some protections that citizens in other states don't. And when it comes to the digital economy, boundaries are meaningless, right? I mean, data is meaningless. Um, so it, the data, the idea that we would have some protections in one place and not another makes no sense. Um, and so th that's the government role. I, again, I just want to emphasize, I think private companies have a deep responsibility here. And, and they have, I think, in some ways recognized it publicly, but not internally. You know, they have chosen to come into our lives in a very personal way. Uh, their products are sleeping next to us, right? And probably in your pocket right now. The, the things that they're collecting about us represent very intimate details about our lives. The tools that are applied to this data create even more detailed profiles about us that could be right, could be wrong. We don't, we don't really have that information. It's hard to see. But regardless, they have chosen to take that step into our personal lives. And in my opinion, that behooves an ethical responsibility to, to try to point innovation in the direction of protectionism. John? So um, in the absence of a baseline privacy law, which I also lament, but I recognize as reality, um, there are some things that companies and government entities who are engaging in big data analysis can do and need to do, right? First thing they have to do is they have to institutionalize ethical review, right? Because if ethical review is not a part of the product development process, if it's not a part of the assessment when companies and other entities roll out new features and use data in new ways, then it's not going to get done. The questions aren't going to be asked, and very straightforward mitigation steps are not going to be taken. So it, number one has to be institutionalized. The next thing that needs to happen is wherever that role for ethical review is institutionalized, those folks need to do a ton of triage. Because the truth is that there are any number of uses of big data that raise few or no ethical concerns, right? If you're trying to discover the best service interval, interval for an avionics part in an aircraft, there's no personal data there. There are few or no ethical concerns, right? And you need to get that off the plate of the ethical review institutionalized board or body or committee or whatever it is very, very quickly so that you can actually focus on the real stuff. And once you identify some issues as important, there's a further triage step that needs to happen, right? And I think Mark was, um, was really savvy in flagging the question of transparency around the decision, how decisions are made by an algorithm, whether it's in a black box or whether it's auditable or, or, or things like that. Because I think that, that some big data research, some big data uses um, raise separate questions, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a big internet company and you are rolling out an online music service. So all of your users can get personalized music recommendations to listen to on their mobile device or, or elsewhere, right? Um, you use an algorithm to do this. Now, we surely want that to be accurate so that I get lots of recommendations for Bruce Springsteen and not many recommendations for Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> but the downside for me getting bad recommendations with that algorithm is actually fairly limited, right? Um, the downside to that same company putting out an inaccurate algorithm to control their driverless automobile is really, really big. So if that same technology puts out a driverless car that relies on big data to avoid collisions and it employs inaccurate algorithms to do that, my health and safety and that of others are implicated. So there's real ethical implications there. But what's interesting about that question is, I think there's a fair question to be asked in that scenario about whether we care as a society how that algorithm works as long as it's accurate. If that driverless car avoids a lot of collisions and saves a lot of lives, we may not be super interested in interrogating what the factors were that made it really accurate and life-saving, right? Final example, that same big technology company decides that they're going to produce a product that can screen applicants for jobs. 
Well, in that scenario, we're interested in both the accuracy of the algorithm and the factors that it's taking into consideration. So I think that the institutionalization of ethical review is super important, and I think the triaging role becomes critically important as all of these new products and services are thrown at that institutionalized ethical review. I How just do want you to push back on something yeah, really quick. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's just go. So the, the idea of um, you, none of these technologies exist in a vacuum, right? So the idea that you're, you have an algorithm that's giving, that's sort of identifying songs that you might like or, or artists that you might like, what happens also is that you have been profiled, right? Mm -hmm. So there is there is an assumption or inferences that are made about you because of the type of music that you like. They know I'm from Jersey with Prob the Springsteen thing. Yeah, it, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so they so these inferences though have other applications. Mm -hmm. So if you think about Facebook, they had um, an ethnic affinity car uh, category for advertisers. This was something they rolled out at South by Southwest. They were really proud of this. And it was based on a lot of things, like the type of music that you like. The idea was that they were targeting um, different kinds of ethnic affinity, which, as, as you can imagine, raised some alarm bells for the fact that it could be a proxy for race and other kinds of, of potentially discriminatory um, inferences. So what happened with, with the ethnic affinity is Facebook realized through advocacy and other, other efforts that they were allowing their advertisers, people who were, for example, uh, renters or landlords, who were targeting ethnic affinity, they were basically allowing them to not advertise to certain groups, which is, of course, against the law, right? That's against the, the, Fair, Credit, the Fair, uh, Fair Housing Act. Thank you. <laughs> so so the, the, the point that I want to make is that in sort of this, this uh, utopia of, of it's just doing this, it's just giving me my song recommendations, yeah, that, that sounds really benign, but the truth of, of the way that these systems work is that they're all very interrelated and almost always tied to advertising, almost always tied to a monetization system that may or may not benefit you. So that one benefit that you get in convenience or something else or accuracy may be outweighed by the other opportunities that you lose. I, I don't disagree, and I think if you're doing an ethical review, you have to do a holistic ethical review. You, you don't get to do a siloed ethical review of these particular issues. Mm -hmm. If it's a song recommendation engine that's used to recommend songs, that's one thing. If it's a song recommendation that's used to drive an advertising ecosystem that enables housing discrimination, that's a completely separate thing. And I think that, that, that any kind of institutionalized ethical review needs to take account of that. No question. And can I jump in on yeah. uh, something that Michelle said earlier, uh, talking about the sort of differences between the US model and the, the European model, um, there are clear differences. I would say uh, the FTC, the FTC uh, as an enforcer, as a privacy and data security enforcer, is by far the most active enforcer in the world. We've ha brought 500 plus uh, privacy or data security related um, cases. So I, I don't think that industry generally thinks that it's a free for all in the privacy space. This includes, all, this includes cases against all the big names that you know online. Um, and we have many of them under order, uh, and they are required to um, comply with those orders and those settlements. So the model is very different than Europe. Europe has a big, comprehensive, one-size-fits-all law. We have very targeted law, uh, laws that apply to health information, to children's information, um, and then we have all the, the, the laws that apply to bias. And uh, those are different systems. Um, I wouldn't say uh, one is worse or better. Uh, but I would note that uh, a lot of the innovation on the internet happens in the US. And I think our system uh, allows that innovation. And it gets back to the, my concern um, or when we were talking earlier uh, that we need to find ways to allow innovation to benefit consumers because um, stopping innovation, uh, it can harm consumers as well. It, um, even if you're picking one dimension, privacy, data security, and prioritizing that over other ones, such as health or safety. And so um, I, I think the, the FTC and the US system balances those well. Um, it can always get better. Um, but I, but I, I, I wouldn't um, compare us negatively to the rest of the world in how we protect consumer privacy and, and data security. On that point, Neil, do you think that um, given how quickly these tools are advancing and how quickly the likes of Google and Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft are kind of 
redoubling their efforts and, and just uh, moving so fast into the future into ways that we can't even really understand right now. Their R&D efforts are um, you know, going, they're thinking already 15 years ahead where we're ba barely trying to, you know, able to catch up to what they're doing right now. Do you think that uh, you know, given your, your point earlier about making sure that any rules or regulations don't stand in the way of the benefits that can come from that, do you think that there are, that the government currently has the, enough tools, enough um, tools in its toolbox to be able to address some of these thorny issues that we've been talking about, particularly from the FTC's perspective? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I think that there are, like I said, there are ways that, that we can improve. And, and the FTC has asked for uh, nationwide uh, data security and breach notification legislation. I think that's an area in which um, there has been some consensus at the FTC, and I think a, a lot in industry as well, about data breach notification in particular, uh, a uniform standard making a lot of sense in that space. Uh, that's different than a, a general privacy law. Sure. Um, and, but I do think that that makes some sense. And there's some other things that, that the FTC has asked Congress for, things that are very um, in the weeds, such as removal of a common carrier exemption that, that limits the FTC from addressing certain concerns. But uh, uh, our tools are working well in many ways. I think we face challenges of keeping up. Um, I like to think that there's somebody out there who can see 15 years into the future, but I doubt that Google or Amazon or any of those companies know what the world will really look like in 15 years, and they are trying, um, they are trying very hard to keep up with their competitors, just as we are uh, at, in the government are trying uh, hard to keep up with understanding what they're all doing together. So um, I don't know that we're at such a disadvantage um, uh, as that, but. Uh, but it is, a, it is a challenge, and it's, it's something that requires uh, government and talent in government and talent in industry and cooperation, uh, both with those two groups and with um, groups like Michelle. It's, I think one of the, the hardest things about um, the most challenging part of, of the way the FTC operates is that it, it has to bring cases after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. And, and this is, is, I think, frustrating to people. The FTC also, it, it's, a, it, the, its mandate is not that it can sort of proactively say this is a harm. So if you're a person who has experienced disparate impact, first of all, you probably don't know it. Um, and even if you did, the remedies don't really exist. It's very difficult unless you have a very specific complaint and it's provable. So again, the reason we talk about transparency is because it's almost impossible to prove. It's almost impossible to, to be able to identify how you were harmed in that way when it's something like you just weren't presented with an opportunity or you were denied the, the ability to see a job that you might be a good fit for. So it's really a difficult um, paradigm in that sense, I think, or challenging. And Mark, I wanted to bring you into this conversation uh, since you are in the private sector and running a company that deals in data and open data and pairing public data with private data and trying to make sure that we are getting the, the most benefit out of, of that. What does your, how does your company approach some of these issues and, and handling some of the ethical questions that might arise from the use of the data that you're working with? And what are some of your peers or, or other companies that you're working with or seeing, thinking about um, as we approach these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's again, you know, a moment in, in these conversations where I think they're top of mind for uh, everyone in the industry and sort of unfolding um, uh, every day. So for us, we do a lot of work that um, falls under the umbrella of, of pre-existing regulatory regimes. So um, you know, when it comes to things like um, you know, credit underwriting for big banks and things like that, there are well-established uh, rules governing what are, what are fair lending practices and what aren't. Um, and in many respects, I think you know, one of the things that is also easy to overlook when we talk about um, you know, these, these things that start to verge on, on science fiction of big data and data science and, and all of the rest is that there's, there still remains um, a tremendous amount of infrastructural challenge for the actual application of data. Um, and that you know, I think there's sort of this interesting divide happening where on the one hand, um, you, know, you do have companies at a level of sophistication like Facebook or like uh, Google, who sort of grew up on the internet and sort of grew up as data first uh, businesses. I think what's you know, really fascinating and what's going to be an extremely important trend to watch over the next 
really five or 10 years is when we watch um, sort of the rest of the economy start to datafy. So when we, we look at um, older guard businesses like um, uh, manufacturing or like insurance or things of, of that nature. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting for us, we've, we've had a lot of great success on um, issues related to um, things very simple like pharmaceutical uh, safety in a lot of ways. And so there's a, you know, a lot of low hanging fruit that we've found um, sort of you know, echoing a point that you made earlier before we're getting into issues around um, personal identifiability and, and uh, privacy, you know, what can be done around um, making sure that supply chains for drugs are functioning well and that you're able to relate things like uh, temperature sensors and shipping containers to adverse event reports that happen at, at pharmacies and making sure that from a safety perspective this data can be held in the same frame. Um, and so I think it's certainly important when we start to think you know, critically about the applications of um, data and analytics within society and, with the, and within the economy that we differentiate in between things that uh, touch on individuals, be that in a really direct and targeted way, or um, to your point, touch on individuals in ways that um, govern the, uh, sort of the, the, the manner in which uh, resources or opportunities are distributed. And so I think you know, when we approach these problems, and I would say certainly within um, uh, sort of our peers in the, in the sort of uh, technology community that think about this, um, there's, this is sort of a, a kind of framework that we bring to it. And one more question before we get to the audience question is one that we see written a lot about, and some say it's overblown, some say we aren't talking about it enough, is the impact of these technologies on jobs. Yeah. Um, and Mark, to your point, as, as these technologies become more verticalized and are integrated into industries that have so far kind of or not as been integrated with technology as others, manufacturing, agriculture, um, healthcare delivery, law, Law, <laughs> thank you. Um, what, and I, I would love all of your, your takes on this, what do you think the real impact to jobs will be? And do you think that the fears and anxieties that um, you know, the media is, is kind of stoking in some ways by writing about every new report with estimates of millions and millions of jobs you know, being displaced in some way or another, it, how do we deal with that? Is that overblown? Do you think that that is really going to just more augment human action and human work rather than replace entirely? Or do you think it's really something that we need to deal with on a larger scale with more urgency? Um, John, do you want to start? Sure. It's a way bigger deal um, than anybody's talking about. I, I, I shouldn't say anybody, than most folks are talking about and most folks appreciate. Um, the data on this, I think, is straightforward and clear. Some of it is buried in disability benefit data, which is masking unemployment under another name. Some of it is buried in the industries that Mark is discussing that are transitioning to digital. Um, I think if you talk to the folks who are deeply concerned about these issues, they have the better of this argument. We need to have a societal conversation about what life looks like post 40 hour, five day work week. Um, it's probably gonna look pretty good for a lot of people if we manage it right, and it's probably gonna look pretty awful for most people if we don't. So I, I think, I know, I know and I appreciate and I understand that the media overblows a lot of stories and you can get fatigue about bad news and a bunch of this other stuff. This is an opportunity to have a real social conversation that I don't think we're having right now. Um, Michelle? I'm thinking about a conversation I had with a, a union activist, yeah. and and she was an incredible activist. She was she was talking about how automation will take over trucking, and I think this is something sort of known and understood is going to happen. What she was talking about though was the impact on people that this would have. So the idea that slowly you have companies like Uber and others who are leasing vehicles and eventually will go into delivery and into trucking type services, it may not look like a truck, um, but that they, maybe it's a drone, but they will um, replace people. And, and what happens in advance of that, and I think this kind of gets to your point a little bit, is where the rub is. So what you see with a company like Uber, not, not to pick on them, but hey, let's pick on them. They <laughs> are, you know, have design systems that are um, devalue the human part of, of the transaction. 
So, you know, they pay their drivers um, not very well. They recently allowed people to tip, which is great, but that wasn't the case for a long time. They actually incentivized through their automated systems um, extended driving, things that weren't good for the, the driver or the passenger. And, and a lot of this is their belief that they're a technology company solely. And, and so therefore, the human factor, the human element, is, is actually the biggest cost and the thing that they would like to mitigate the most. And so what happens is, rather than seeing data as a, a tool to advance our ideals and to advance um, you know, humanity and, and things that we hope for, like a, a, good, a better society, a more harmonious society, um, they are looking at data as the tool to make money. And I think that's, that's sort of where the ethical problem is. There's nothing wrong with that, per se. There's nothing wrong with the idea that you're, you want to monetize this, this tool. But the problem is it's at the expense of, of the humanity there. And so if we allow this to sort of overtake our economy and, and allow it to overtake the ethos and make it more important than any kind of human ideals, then I think we, we look at the future that is not helping everybody and, in fact, again, sort of continues to divide um, you know, haves and have-nots. Um. When I think about the future of work, I, I sort of see two categories of, of issues here. Uh, one, as has been discussed, is certainly around questions of automation and the fact that people that have jobs doing certain things today uh, won't have those jobs in the future because machines will do them. And, and I think that's certainly a, a, you know, going to be a huge issue, as has been discussed, that's going to have massive ramifications on, on the economy and, and the polity. Um, I think the second bucket of issues for me are the ways in which the kind of balance of power in, in the workplace is shifted because of algorithmic and, and data-driven systems. So, um, you know, as was mentioned, I think when we think about gig economy platforms and the ways in which, um, you know, the rights of, of individual workers and of, um, you know, sort of what happens in terms of, of labor precarity and what happens in terms of the agency of uh, individuals in those systems is, is certainly a, a, big, um, a big issue. I think further, when we start to look deeper into the workplace and see um, algorithmic systems coming into things like um, human resource platforms, this becomes a big issue. So there was a, a, a controversy um, somewhat recently about uh, a sort of an HR interviewing um, application where it would use facial recognition uh, on interview candidates to basically try to rank them against uh, the sort of gestures and, and sort of um, you know, facial uh, expressiveness as other sort of people that were deemed as, as star performers within a company. And this, of course, has a risk of um, you know, sort of calcifying a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of organization, a certain kind of um, uh, bias that's maybe less inclusive and baked in because these are organizations that uh, have been around for a while. And I think you know, throughout all of this, really, what is, is really paramount to stay attuned to is you know, understanding really what the broader externalities within, uh, within the workplace and within society at large of these um, algorithmic systems are as they become installed like pieces of infrastructure in some ways that will really persist far into the future. Um, so let me start with a disclaimer. Uh, like everything I've said tonight, um, these are my own thoughts and don't necessarily represent the FTC's thoughts, uh, but this especially. I was wondering where uh, that disclaimer was going to come. <laughs> in, in, part, in part because the FTC, um, that's not part of the, the future of work is not necessarily one of the roles that they play um, in, in regulating the economy. Um, but this is an audience that I think here at the National Archives appreciates history. And I think the story of history suggests that humankind is very good at taking new technologies and making the, the world benefiting from them. The last 200 years, I think there's no doubt that uh, it has been an amazing stretch for humanity. Um, when you look at the, you know, the, the, the centuries before that, uh, life was brutal, short, and nasty for sure. And it is much less so for a much larger percentage of the world now. And, uh, and I think that uh, big data has great opportunity to continue that trend. And when I think about the benefits of it, um, I think of it as, as um, uh, you know, Aristotle talks about like what is the good life. And, 
And I think that's, big data gives us a chance to answer that question much more individually about like what is the good life the way I want to live it, um, rather than uh, having to necessarily adopt somebody else's vision of what is a good life. And so I'm very optimistic, uh, generally. I mean, there are definitely challenges for a lot of people, and, but I think that, uh, I think that history shows that um, we will deal with those challenges uh, as necessary. And uh, there's work to be done, for sure, but I think we can do it. Thank you. And with that, I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience, so we have plenty of time to hear from you. Uh, there are microphones on both sides, on mid-stair on both sides, if you do have a question. Make your way over to one of those. Uh, yes, sir. Um, hi. So I'm curious, um, so you mentioned big data and how it's going to be used, but so as more and more people choose to kind of maybe attempt to opt, opt out, so using VPNs, um, encryption, uh, maybe even right to be forgotten legislation, um, how that's going to sort of affect the data sets that we're drawing from if they're not being represented there? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I will answer only um, briefly, but to say, I think you're right to identify that as a trend. Um, more and more people have begun to turn to tools like encryption and, and, and VPNs, and in fact, those have become civil liberties um, arguments. You know, if you take, for example, the Apple versus uh, Apple versus FBI and the discussion about whether, you know, phones should be encrypted or have back doors available to law enforcement, you, it sort of raises it up as, as a key issue. The lack of representation extends not just in data sets but in policy. I mean, you know, no offense, but look at us. <laughs> you know, we are not that diverse, and, and this is the case in almost every place in, that I speak or that I've gone to to have policy discussions. And so beyond the idea, which I think is crucially important, when you don't have people represented, um, you cannot be responsive to their needs. And then you, you, do, you sort of perpetuate the structural bias that we talked about before. Um, but also in policy discussions, you create policies that aren't reflective necessarily. They're reflective of ideas you might have about things like poverty, or ideas you might have about what it means to, to have, have privacy or freedom but they don't reflect all of the communities that make this country great. So I think it's a huge problem. I think that is responsive to maybe the future of having people who have sort of benefited from technology and data and people who have not at all. And I think that is a, a serious concern. I'm glad you raised it. Does anyone else have anything to add on that? Or? I might just add really quickly that uh, I, I totally agree with that. It is, a, it is a big challenge, and it's not just the sort of uses, the, the self-help tools that people might use, but um, there's, there's populations that just don't have access to the technologies. And then on top of that, policy can have a big impact. I know we, we cover a lot of rules about like having parents opt in for children uh, when children want to use uh, you know, data-driven data tools at school. Um, that can be very challenging in households where parents aren't paying attention. And, and the, the households where parents are paying attention uh, tend to already be ahead, right? So, so how we set policies around data collection can actually really um, make a big difference uh, to, to whether or not uh, the society is inclusive. I think it's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, of course, I have all kinds of questions, but I'll, I'll <laughs> try to do one. Um, in as much as the context is ethical, I think uh, all of you touched in one way or another on, I think, a distinction between big data that's used for avionics or refrigerators and cargo containers or things like that where we can say, fine, you know, <laughs> great. But when we're talking about a job interview or education or something else that, that has to do with human experience and human endeavor, um, those are when those ethical questions come into play. And I'd like to pick on something that you said right at the outset, which was in the context of education, which was something like, um, you know, we can do a better job preparing students, kids, young adults to, f to function or to, to participate in an economy. And there was this discussion about kind of quantification and, mo uh, and monetization and so on. And, you know, it seems like really ultimately the goal of educating somebody is, is maybe not as measurable as we'd like. And, and the use of, of big data and so on kind of pushes everybody to, to 
to work in that context and to strive for achievement in, this, in a way that can be calculated or measured, uh, sort of a tyranny of, of, the, of that quantification. So my question is, what are the places where, um, where it's not appropriate or it's not, um, whether it's ethically or sort of in the big human picture, um, to be working with big data because it's really a conformer. It's really a, 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 something that's going to try to put things in, in uh, certain containers that, um, that disregard or devalue individualism or creativity or intellectual progress or something like that. I, I hope that's manageable. <laughs> I'm not sure I articulated it very well. No, it, it makes a ton of sense. Sense you've got a sympathetic ear up here. I've got a I've got an undergrad degree in philosophy. Okay, so I I, I get the fact that's not super marketable. Um, <laughs> it turned out okay ultimately. I just I, I'm good. I'm good. I got some place to go to home after the show. Really, I'm okay. Um, it, it, it's kind of nice too. But it, the thing is, um, I completely appreciate that the um, the the purpose at heart of education is to support human flourishing, right? And it is very, very hard to look inside the hearts and souls of men and women and quantify in big data terms whether or not, you know, talking about John Rawls and his theory of justice really made them happier. It made me happier, I can say that, um, and I think it has added immeasurably to my satisfaction in life but I agree with you, it's not quantifiable. When I think about kids and young adults who are not reading as well as they could, who, are, who don't have the level of numeracy to function in 2017, these are basic measurable thresholds that I think um, folks really can use to go on to the more fulfilling levels of education. And I don't mean to be derogatory about those higher and more fulfilling levels of education, um, but I think we as a society can do a better job getting everybody over those initial competency hurdles. And that's all I was trying to do. But like I said, you've got a sympathetic ear. I do think, oh, sorry, I, just, I, I hear you. And I, it's something I think about, too. I have, I have children, and you know, they're in front of their Google Chromes um, all day. And that, that's a worries me a little bit. Also the idea that somehow they're being judged on by numbers. And of course, we believe that numbers are fact. It's, it's an erroneous belief, but it's something that I think it sort of pervades in our society. And I have a good example of why this, how this can go wrong, too. Um, I'm thinking about employee wellness programs, which I, I really dislike for a lot of reasons. But one of them is because they use metrics to measure against that are outdated and reflect a certain kind of person and not at all our individuality. And in fact, the use of data in the workplace in general is problematic. There are sensors that determine whether or not you've gotten up and walked around, and that means that you are collaborative, right? So we, we take the numbers and we sort of assign <laughs> meaning to them. No, really. And, and that you're creative, that this is occurring. Um, and so you know, when we take numbers and we assign meaning to them, or if we take numbers and assign you know, sort of goals to them. So for the employee wellness program, for example, many of the programs are based on BMI, which has been debunked as, as a useful tool for measuring the many different kinds of body types that we have. But nonetheless, it is used, and, and if you don't meet a certain goal, regardless of that rationale, you pay money. So the consequences exist, and the consequences in the education context exist. If you don't have great internet access or internet access at all at home, you know, you, you are being measured based on what the productivity that your child, you know, the child is being measured based on how much they can do, and much of that is at home now. So how do we account for that, those sorts of differences beyond even the idea of creativ creativity, but just sort of the structural differences, the individuality that exists in us, and numbers don't accommodate that at all. Yeah, I would just like that quickly from my perspective. Um, uh, it's interesting, it really, to me, focuses on a question of how and for what purposes we hold algorithms accountable in a certain way. I mean, conformity can be a very good thing when it comes to trying to use big data to understand you know, what ought the fire codes to be, like what are the baseline sorts of attributes of spaces that we should have so if there's a fire, we can all get out in, in 30 seconds or whatever. Um, and I think you know, what's really at issue right now is as these new algorithmic systems are being developed, 
we need, I think we can almost imagine a model where we you know, certify them for particular purposes or have a certain idea of you know, approved uses of certain algorithms. So if you want to sort of apply an analytics of space uh, for like a fire safety code, I think we can do a study and understand how that impacts people. If we want to do it for how do we design a public park or how do we design you know, an, an office layout or other sorts of intimate spaces, different sets of concerns. So I think you know, the focus shouldn't be just on sort of generically certifying things, but always really understanding how they're you know, uh, playing out in, in a particular context. We'll go over here, sir. Thank you. Uh, so it's my impression that one of the things that really uh, promotes the amassing of large quantities of data is that, at least in the commercial realm, in general, when I engage in a transaction uh, with some commercial entity, I lose my rights in that data. And I'm wondering if you think there would be any benefit uh, toward the ethical use of data if, if I could retain some of those rights. Neil, you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so let me challenge your premise a little bit. Um, let's take an example. This conversation that we're having right now, whose data is it? Is it your data? Is it my data? Um, if, I go and tell, I, if I go back and tell somebody, oh, I had this conversation, um, am I violating your rights? on that. So the question is, I, and I, I don't have good answers to this. I think it's a really hard problem. But when you're interacting with another entity where you're using the service and they're collecting some information about how you use that service, um, I'm not talking about your you know, social security number or examples like that, but more like how you browse through their web page. The question is, if we're going to do a rights-based system, how do we, in a principled way, decide whose right it is? Um, and I think that's very challenging. Uh, so I think you've put your finger on a really hard question. We do that with medical data. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. We don't do it with commercial data at all. Right. So I think that's an interesting ethical question, perhaps, is what's the right use and what's the wrong use? That doesn't right. And, and the FTC, uh, the, the, where, the way the FTC has addressed some of those issues has been by focusing on where, where harm is likely to occur. And that tends to align very much with sensitive data, right? So, um, and much less so with non-sensitive, non-personally identified data. Um, not always true in all cases, but that is sort of how the distinction has been made. And it's a sort of, I guess if we're gonna talk ethics, it's a sort of utilitarian approach that the goal would be to minimize the injury to consumers because there are a lot of benefits to these other uses of data. And so, um, so I think that's how the line has been drawn uh, in the U.S. and, and in, at the FTC, um, although, again, my remarks. We do have examples in the U.S., though, of, of laws addressing shared resources. So if you think about the community park, it doesn't belong to, you know, maybe the government sort of retains a certain um, stewardship over it, which I think, you know, this analogy I think could work in the, in the, the data repository sense. And we all use it or lease it for a time, right? The time that we are there and then when we leave. We have shared resources that I think data, I think it would actually, it would work fairly well. I think the problem is that we don't have any affirmative rights in the, in the United States or protections when it comes to data. So right now, it's, there's a complete imbalance. Um, you, in fact, have very, very few rights at all when it comes to your, your data. And you know, the idea, like I said before, and I referenced this before, that this is becoming a part of our, our lives in a very personal way, and data is representative of us in this ecosystem. I think that you're absolutely right. It's an ethical consideration for companies and for the government to consider. But as of yet, th this has not been the case at all. And I think, you know, to be frank, there's a very powerful lobby that the technology companies have in Washington, DC, and elsewhere that have made it incredibly difficult to have these kinds of conversations. And you know, I think in some ways people feel like the cat's out of the bag. You know, that we we have sort of lived in this ecosystem where data is collected ubiquitously without our knowledge a lot of times and used not necessarily to our benefit. So, I, I think we do have some examples of ways that we could approach it. Yes, sir. Uh, when I recently bought an HP computer, uh, which features Cortana, 
I didn't realize I was going to have to get a Microsoft account, which asked for my date of birth, for Cortana to work for me. Uh, I think that's an FTC issue. I think that shouldn't be allowed to force feed the big data machine uh, to get the benefits that you paid cash for. And as a consequence, the only revenge you can get is to create a ridiculous creature. The date of birth has nothing to do with me and to screw up the data machine any way you can. So I'd like your comments on those two I like points. That. <laughs> well, I, I, might, I might point out that that might be an example of the sort of uh, a challenge that I, was, that I was discussing before. There's a trade-off there, right? So the no, 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 there's no trade-off. I paid cash for that computer with that feature. There was no little asterisk on the box. You don't get this unless you put in your personal data. I, I, that wasn't part of the, the transaction. The transaction was cash for the, for the computer with the features. There was no trade-off. I, I, I understand your point, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent question And the question benefit about of that big data doesn't accrue to me in the first place. So it's uh, not I'm getting something for putting my personal data out. I, I, the challenge I was pointing out is that uh, the concern might be we have very specific and strict laws about how children's data can be collected. And so they may be collecting your date of birth to make sure you're not a child. And that is, that is uh, that's a challenging policy issue. How do we make those choices? And I, I am sympathetic to your concerns. There's other ways to figure out whether you're a child or not. You know, credit card information usually would tell you that. Yes, yes, there, there certainly are. There certainly are other ways. That's pretty phony, actually. Can you do better than that? I mean, I... <laughs> I, so the question is: the question is, would you want Microsoft collecting your credit card data post purchase as well? I mean, the, the, it is a challenging issue, and I don't have an answer. The, the credit, an answer. whoever gets the computer to get Cortana to work, somebody has to create a Microsoft account. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with me buying the HP computer, and, and it's not an option if you want to use the feature. So you can only screw it up intentionally. If, if I could just jump in for a second. Sure. I think it, it echoes a bit of the, the earlier question also that I, I certainly know we have two uh, attorneys on the panel, so I might be speaking somewhat out of turn. But it does kind of occur to me that in a lot of contexts in which personal data is collected, there is something of a, a um, I mean, I don't know, almost a sort of a crisis of the model of consent that we have to giving it. I mean, because in a lot of times people have to use internet services, mm -hmm. they buy computers, they don't necessarily have options to do this, and you know, there's reams and reams and thousands of pages of contracts that you're agreeing to that give companies all the rights to your data. And perhaps to your point, I mean, thinking about what more sort of standard models around those are, are kinds of conversations that we need to have at, at the sort of federal and, and public level. But, you know, again, whenever there has been legislation sort of addressing this idea that, if, for example, a company needs to ask your permission before they can, you know, like an ISP, your internet service provider, should ask for your permission before they use a certain subset of your data considered sensitive. That has been hugely pushed back on and defeated in, in many states and, uh, and on a federal level. So um, I think the, there has to be a public component to this. And, and that is something I feel like privacy advocates like you know, myself and CDT, I feel like we have failed to really engage the public in this in a way that is constructive. And it's something I think about all the time. You know, how, how do we not just inform the public, because I feel like the media does a decent job of that. People are not stupid. They, they understand the circumstances under which they, their data is collected, like you, you mentioned. But how do we engage them in the process so that they're they're pushing back on the companies and saying, hey, this is something that we want, and we are not going to go away and just be sort of docile with the convenience that you're offering, which is sort of always the, the sell. And I suspect the data is not just collected, it's sold. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it, it's not just sold, but you know, it's combined. So yeah. um, depending on the company model, they will have a data set about you, of the data that they've collected. But then they will also upend it and, and mingle it with other kinds of data that they might purchase or they might sell it to, to data brokers and others. And what's the integrity of that data if people you know, put in phony, phony account information? Right. I think part of the reason they do that is to verify, right? to, to try to, to get it as accurate as possible. Because their, how can their they models verify what are I put in? How so could in they the verify interest of that? How time, I, I know that there are several other questions here, and we only have about 10 more minutes, so I want to make sure that we get to as many people as possible. Um, sir, did you have a question on this side? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, on a global scale, 
if there was some, if you had a perfect world and you didn't have to argue with Congress to do this, but there's a <laughs> law or policy somewhere that you think on a day, whether it be with data or internet or something privacy related that you see working somewhere else that you could possibly, you could bring to America and not have Congress, you know, argue about it forever to make it be policy? Is there something that you're seeing somewhere else that's actually working that you wish you could have here? So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll lead off. Um, I, I would say I think there are, um, there are two key things that you see in data protection regulations around the world um, that, you know, if I could go be king of the Congress, I would probably look at very seriously tomorrow. The first is um, having really strong incentives, and you can fiddle with the legislative language in various ways, but the core principle would be to have really strong incentives for companies to conduct um, a disparate impact ana analysis when they employ big data analysis or machine learning, right? And there's this question of um, how can companies know when their algorithmic decisions are biased? Well, they can employ some of the same technical tools to perform an analysis on the outcomes, right? And I think that by providing incentives, whether they're safe harbor incentives or whether they're other incentives, liability incentives, um, to perform that kind of disparate impact analysis, I think you will enable companies who genuinely do not want to um, promote housing discrimination, employment discrimination, insurance discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, you will put them in a better legal position to do so and, and, and give them that nudge to do so. The second thing I would say is similar sorts of incentives to uh, promote encryption technologies and other privacy enhancing technologies that safeguard data so that when something does go wrong, whether it's a data breach or something else, the impacts on individuals are mitigated. Those would be my two. I, I'm sure there are others. Those are great answers, I think. Um, the idea <laughs> the uh, security is a place where it, it, it does seem very possible um, to, to act, maybe achieve legislation. We'll see. Um, things like Equifax and other data breaches really galvanize Congress in a way that not a lot of issues do. Um, I think because they realize that they also are, are part of that. I mean, they've experienced the Office of Personnel Management, which um, breached you know, tons of incredibly sensitive data about themselves and their family members and their relatives and friends. You know, it extends. So I, I think that that is definitely a possibility. The idea that you need to fine a company is absolutely at the heart of it. You know, I look at, for example, um, HIPAA, you know, the health privacy law in this country, and when the Office of Civil Rights, high tech was passed, amended HIPAA, and created um, serious fines for companies that did not implement um, parts of the privacy and security rule of HIPAA. So what happened? The company started doing it because when OCR, when the Office of Civil Rights started enforcing that, they were paying millions of dollars, not, not always, not every company, but it started to be clear that this was going to happen, and so the companies um, took it very seriously and started implementing. It doesn't stop every breach, doesn't stop every problem, but it, it, it creates a, a very different um, playing field than one that exists now. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I ask a question in part to diversify the data set of respondents asking questions. <laughs> Um, Thank it you. doesn't need applause. <laughs> the actual <laughs> question, uh, my interaction with algorithms and predictive analytics have basically been used in their use to predict crime and violence, both where it occurs and who's at high risk of it. Interestingly enough, we've spent so much of this conversation talking about how data analytics are being used by private industry, but they actually are being used at this point a lot by government. And recognizing everything you guys have said about how um, sort of fundamentally unfair they can be, and also the fact that just as a field, we don't know that much about them. Are we doing enough to focus on their use and implementation in government and to regulate that? Great question. So it's actually interesting. I, a few weeks ago, I was uh, at a city council meeting in New York City where a law is recently introduced um, that uh, aims at requiring the um, basically the, the publication or transparency around all of the uh, algorithms that the city uses to make decisions. And so that ranges from how people get assigned to different school districts to how the fire department decides how many firemen to put in every district um, and, and everything else in between. Um, and I think you know this seems to be one of the first uh, proposals, at least at a local level, um, for that degree of transparency. 
you know, and certainly the you know the issues that it it raised. It was from it was actually int interestingly introduced by uh, a councilman Vaca, who's a, a councilman from the the Bronx in New York City, and had been a longstanding councilman there, and sort of was you know hearing from his constituents quite a bit that uh, the you know not only were the outcomes of of things like um, a sort of number of firemen of, you know, employed in the district and the places uh, where people were getting assigned to school districts very unfair, but even he as a councilman was unable to go and audit them and get in, in touch with these agencies and find out. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, there's at a, at a table stakes level a huge issue around transparency in, in government decision making that uh, gets lost behind you know, what, what are often these black box decision machines. Mm -hmm. um, so I think your point is absolutely well taken that in order to even have a robust democratic process, we need to be able to understand what are the conditions under which the government is, is making decisions. We, we've thought a lot about this question at CDT and tried to think about what is the best strategy for approaching this problem. And the way that we've decided to approach it is to look at contracts. So to look, you know, this is almost always um, the government contracting with private entities who are developing the analytics tools or whatever it is. Um, and so those are not easy to get, right? You know, they're not necessarily um, available. They're not necessarily, FOIAing them is a possibility, but it's, a, it, it's also a process. So what we've started to do, and in fact, we did this with, with um, Vaca's bill, was say the government should require certain metrics from their contractors. So explain to us what your accuracy rate is and how you arrived at that. What is the error rate, right? Because when we're talking about resource deployment, the error rate really matters, and it's something that's not available right now. And in fact, when we've spoken to government um, employees on the local state level, um, they don't even know the right questions to ask because they don't often understand the tools or how they're actually you know, sort of spitting back data. So this, this is the way that we're approaching that. Um, and then also speaking to Congress about ha holding hearings on the subject of algorithmic transparency, um, really trying to open the government up and, and talk about how the tools are being used. But as of right now, the biggest hurdle to that is that they're private contracts. And you know, the, only, the ones that I've seen, which I, I've gotten you know, from sources, are typically, there's not even money exchanged half the time, it's the IP. So the data analytics company is getting, you know, is teaching, it's, it's sort of teaching its tools to be better, and it's using our data to do that. So um, it, it's a huge problem, but we, we're definitely trying to tackle it too. Two really quick points. Government absolutely has to be held to a higher standard. And second, um, I think that the government should be held to answer the question, why is this program better, more efficient, fairer, less discriminatory than the human alternative? Because there are some circumstances where the human alternative is really, really bad, right? right? So you might welcome the algorithm. And there's some circumstances where the human alternative is actually really good, and the algorithm is just going to mess stuff up. So. We have time for only one more question, unfortunately. Sorry. Try to keep this uh, brief then. Um, in the development of government and uh, private company partnerships and sharing of big data, there's essentially two separate pools of data. The government holds large, statistically rigorous data sets. And the public entity, you know, the, the private companies, they hold data that is unsystematically collected as a rule. Um, self-selected groups of people uh, interacting with devices and things. When you bring these two sets together, how do you avoid essentially government becoming sort of, you know, the government data becoming a sort of subsidy to these private companies as a tool for, you know, training their data, identifying markets? And it, this can happen in the absence of, you know, actually merging the data, which is a real concern mm -hmm. uh, because, well, I, work in one of those agencies. Uh, so yeah, if you could just uh, speak to that, I would appreciate it. You could it. just send us um, some of <laughs> the contract in which you do this. No, I, 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 somebody else, go ahead. I don't want to talk too much. Um, well, I mean, I, I would just say, I mean, I think certainly, you know, we think about things like the, the census and, and other official statistics that are produced in this country. I mean, it's, I don't think that it's bad that they're used in private industry. I mean, they are sort of you know, a, a sort of a public good that's produced as a utility for all in the country to draw from. Um, I think that, you know, certainly like in the context of, of the census, there's a tremendous amount of statistical rigor applied to making sure that 
the data that's um, reported is uh, like anonymized and something that can't be tracked back into individual respondents and is you know reflective of a, of a broader picture. I mean, I think w one of the interesting issues, and there was actually a, a large conference on this uh, issue in, in Belgium and the European Union last week, is sort of around the shifting roles of official statistics agencies when um, you know, like GDP, for instance, doesn't do a great job of measuring uh, like the gig economy and, and other sorts of things that aren't normally uh, part of their uh, sort of perspective on the world. And you know, what you know, what role do official statistical agencies serve, or what role ought they to play going forward in terms of uh, you know providing richer, more harmonized views to make really important decisions around policy and resource allocation? And uh, I think it's it's an interesting open question. Sure, go ahead. I just want to take the opportunity. I, I did such a bad job of answering your question, which was great, that I, I hope you'd give me another shot. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you then. Um, uh, the, the FTC actually brought a case against Vizio, a smart TV manufacturer um, that uh, sold a smart TV that collected real time uh, viewing information, depending, not no matter what was being shown on the TV, whether it was from your cable system, whether it was from like some over-the-top Netflix provider, whether it was from a DVD that you were playing, it collected that information in real time and sent it, sent it back to a third party. It was bundled with some identifiable information, and then that data was sold. We brought a case against that company along with New York. Um, it's, it's somewhat analogous to, to your example. Um, so I, I, I just want to point out that we have tools and we are trying to apply them. Um, it, it is a complicated issue, but but um, the FTC is, is on the beat. <laughs> <laughs> Better? <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, thank you to our panelists for uh, being here and for such a lively discussion. And thank you all for coming and spending your evening with us. Thank you.